Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with a little chat about a, an article of mine that was just published in a book which was came out and arrived today. It's this, Beethoven the European. There it is. It's really a lovely collection of essays. Beethoven the European, Transcultural Contexts of Performance, Interpretation, and Reception. Whoa, doesn't that sound impressive? Don't you love academia? They have a way of making themselves sound so important. Anyway, um, it's edited by Beethoven scholars, very eminent Beethoven scholars, Malcolm Miller and William Kinderman, and published by Brepholz. There they are, Brepholz, that does a lot of academic publishing. Now, this book was the outcome of a symposium in which I participated that was supposed to take place in Lucca, Italy, but which was canceled because of COVID and turned into one of those online Zoom conference things. And in that, I presented a paper. And the paper that I presented was on the topic of, hang on a moment, Tito, here it is, Beethoven's French liturgical organ music. No, really. That was the title. There are all kinds of wonderful essays in here. We'll talk about a few of those in a moment. But first I get to talk about me. So this topic was something that's obsessed me for years, and I've discussed it on this channel. It was these. Edward Baptiste, the French organist um, who made transcriptions of all of the slow movements from all of the Beethoven symphonies and also the slow movement of the Kreutzer Sonata and something from the Ruins of Athens and some other stuff by Beethoven for organ. And what fascinated me about Baptiste, and you can check out the video, which I'll just summarize briefly, is that in transcribing string tone, particularly for the organ, he indicated very specific registrations which employ vibrato extensively and continuously. And since he made these transcriptions in the 1850s and 1860s, somewhere around there, we don't know the exact date, uh, we know by analogy what orchestras of the time generally did or what they might have sounded like in the days before recording. And one of the qualities of their string timbre was vibrato, which of course means that what the period instrument people have been telling us about there being no vibrato till World War One or whatever is complete bullshit. But that, that's a whole nother topic and, and I did it. But what interested me about Baptiste for the purposes of this thing is there's a whole section of essays here um, on Beethoven reception. And what it, really very interesting essays, they are, let me just see, um, Interpreting Beethoven in Spain in the 19th century, um, his, the arrival of his symphonic music uh, to a nascent concert life, and then there's Beethoven and his reception in piano methods in the first half of the 19th century, and there's something called, Who Are You, Mr. Beethoven? And then further light on Clementi's 1807 contract with Beethoven, Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata and the Japanese Reception of Western Music and Reception and Reflection of Beethoven's Work at the Philharmonic Society of New York from 1842 to 1892. So these are all very, very interesting topics and these essays are very interesting to read. And there's a whole other section. There's, there's performance and analysis and there's, let's see, what else have we got here? Other juicy stuff. Politics, aesthetics, and ideology. That's where musicology kind of goes off the rails because these people usually aren't qualified to talk about those things, but they try. And some of it is actually quite interesting. We've got William Kinderman, who's written um, an enormous intellectual history on Beethoven's music, uh, Beethoven's Ninth, as a disputed symbol of community from Thomas Mann's Dr. Faustus to the Brexiteers of 2019. A little bit ambitious, wouldn't you say? And then we've got uh, Beethoven and the Congress of Vienna and the Concert of Europe in 1822-23, Beethoven's um, 100th Todestag in 1927, ideological battles over the composer and his music in Weimar political culture. I mean, all, this is the kind of stuff I used to do um, back in my days as a wannabe uh, history professor. So so this is, this is fun stuff for me. And it was a very, very interesting conference. Um, and the books that they publish, 
that uh, these folks from Luca published. They're doing also the complete Bocherini edition and other things. They do excellent, excellent work and classy work, attractive work, top quality. I'm not recommending that you write out and buy this. It costs like 150 bucks or something. It's very expensive. It's for academic use, really, for libraries and things. But it's a beautiful collection of essays. And the point that interested me and what I wanted to tell you about that is I just thought it was really cool was Beethoven reception. How did Beethoven become a cultural monument? I mean, that was the question. And what really got me going was the idea that, you know, uh, Baptiste was the organist at Les Halles in France, Les Halles, you know, the marketplace, which was a really seamy part of the city, um, really kind of sleazoid. And, and his transcriptions were played apparently um, as communion music, church music during the mass by French organists. They were published. And if somebody from Les Halles, you know, some hooker or street person decided to go to church, they might very well have heard Beethoven. Because the difference between Beethoven, you know, the classical composer that we all know and love, and Beethoven as Beethoven, the icon of classical music, the one who, who got the dog named after him in the movies, that Beethoven, that requires a level of popular assimilation of his music that just becomes so that it just becomes part of our DNA culturally. How would that happen? It's not from people going to symphony concerts, especially in Paris, you know, in the 1850s and 60s, where there was there was there were a couple concert series, but there was basically the Paris Conservatory concerts. So there were only about a dozen of those a year. I mean, they played tons of Beethoven. That's what they were formed to do. But it's still the number of normal people who would be acquainted with Beethoven's music, it had to be through popular media, through organ grinders playing tunes, through excerpts and sniglets and things. And one of those sniglets that people could hear in their average daily life was as communion music. And and so that that question fascinated me. There's no real answer to it because there's no way to really know what was played on any given day and what people heard and went away humming, particularly members of the lower classes because they didn't document themselves or, or were not documented the way members of the upper classes of the cultural thinkers and tastemakers and scribblers who went around talking about everything that they did as something important. But this is important and it's awfully interesting. And one of the things I found, and I just wanted to share this with you, because I thought it was really kind of cool, was in the Library of Congress, in the Library of Congress, there is something called the Hodges family collection. Now, the Hodges family began with Edward Hodges, who lived from 1796 to 1867. Um, he was born in the UK, but he was engaged in 1842, that fateful year when the New York Philharmonic was founded as the New York Philharmonic's founding pianist. And he worked at Trinity Church down on Wall Street, too, where you can still see the cemetery in the church. They've got a wonderful musical organization that recorded the Haydn Masses for Naxos. I mean, they're still around. And they do afternoon concerts for people on Wall Street, lunchtime concerts. It's really nice. I used to go to them. So, you know, when I worked down there. So Edward Hodges was an interesting character. He had two children. One of them was Faustina Hassa Hodges. Now, do you know how Faustina Hassa was? Originally Faustina Bordoni. She was Hassa's wife, and they were the power couple of Baroque, op Baroque opera in Handel's day. It was Faustina who had the fist fight, you know, um, during the performance of Astyanate with uh, Doristante or whoever the other, the other soprano was that caused such a scandal in London. So Faustina Hassa Hodges was his daughter, and his son, the minister, was John Sebastian Bach Hodges. Interesting, isn't it? Now, John Sebastian Bach Hodges was a minister in Maryland, and his papers and his music collection are extant at the Library of Congress. And in that music collection is a selection of these transcriptions. Here they are, all performed on the, the, the Aeolus label by Diego Innocenzi, there he is, or Innocenzi, however you want to pronounce it, a fabulous Swiss organist. So anyway, those things were in his collection. Now, if they were in the collection of John Sebastian Bach Hodges, just love the names, uh, that means that 
people in Protestant churches, or a Protestant church in Baltimore, were listening to excerpts of Beethoven's symphonies played as church music that were composed as Catholic liturgical music um, in England in the 1850s. And this is one of the ways in which Beethoven's music could have been assimilated, have become popularized as part of people's daily lives. I mean, the reason Baptiste made these transcriptions was because there was a furor in France about the fact that French organists would use as communion music, you know, operatic tunes, greatest hits from the theater, you know, the ballet of the nuns raised by Satan and Robert, the Robert le Diable by Meyerbeer. You know, this was causing a scandal because of the, the secularness of the music and the fact that people would come to church to hear the music, I mean, quite often, because they didn't have that much experience of professional music making and that, of that caliber. And to hear what the big tunes were at the opera, you could go to mass and pick them up. And so as a result of that, Baptiste made these Beethoven arrangements because he wanted to create a higher level of French liturgical music. There was also a lot of improvisation going on in original stuff too, don't get me wrong. But it's very ironic that the idea of, of raising the level of liturgical music was instead of writing original liturgical music, which is what happened toward the end of the 19th century, they just plagiarized from what they considered to be a more exalted source. Anyway, so this spread around. How much it spread around, I don't know. The extent to which you'd have to look at all of these music collections and see what was published and who owned it and you know what survives in their papers and their collections um, that we can still trace. Because the Oliver Ditson Company in Boston purchased the rights to publish all of these organ transcriptions, which they did. And so they were available as part of normal repertoire uh, for church organists in the United States. How many people bought them and listened to them? I don't know. How many people encountered Beethoven this way? We don't know. But it was one of the ways. One of the ways that Beethoven became Beethoven, with a capital B. So that's the essay that I did. And I was very honored that it was accepted to be presented at this symposium and then published in the collection. So I just wanted to tell you about it because I think it's kind of nifty. I really do. It's very, very interesting, these topics of how we got where we were, how the great composers became the great composers, how our, our cultural monuments and icons became established, and how classical music filtered down from the, the exalted top back in the days before recordings, before mass media and mass communications. Um, these are all things that I just find absolutely gripping, frankly, as topics for research and study. And so I wanted to share it with you a little bit. So thank you so much for joining me. Keep on listening, friends. Take care.